Hey, boys and girls, Doug Childs here. It's Warriors, Rich, and Wildman. What's happening, Doug? I'll tell you what's happening. Uh, we have Gary DeMar on. And for the uninitiated who, who do not know Gary, I've got to tell everybody in the Warriors and Wildman family, Rich, that they owe me big time for this introduction. And uh, Rich, I know you haven't met Gary, but you're going to enjoy him. Gary served as a president. He's senior fellow right now for American Vision, but he served as president for 35 years. He's a graduate of Western Michigan University. And uh, Rich, he earned his MDiv at Reformed Theological Seminary in 1979. The voices in Gary's head do not stop. He's written 35 books. Uh, Whoa. His two famous ones are, are the ones that that I hear and have read and have gotten a, a lot of accolades is Last Day's Madness, which is an absolute scream. And, uh, and it's uh, theological, uh, um, astute and proper. And uh, his uh, God and Government book, that magnum opus. Uh, Gary hosts the Gary DeMar Show, History Unwrapped, and Gary DeMar's Vantage Point. And he obviously is a regular contributor to his website, American Vision. Dot org. Gary, meet Rich, and welcome to Warriors and Wild Men. Hey, Rich. Uh, good to good to meet you. See you. You and I pretty much share a the same kind of beard, so we're in good. Sh- <laughs> we're, we're good. Great. Then I then I like you already, Gary. Nice to meet you. Welcome to the show. I called it my COVID <laughs> beard. I started growing this back at the beginning of COVID, and I've kept it ever since. So. Oh man. So is it is it moving into the Osama bin Laden uh, phase, Gary? No, nah, my wife keeps me wants me to keep trimming it, but it's a, it's a little, it looks a little bit like riches, just probably a little shorter than riches. Okay. Kind of a John, kind of a the John. Problem, the difference is, is that Rich has got a lot more hair on top right. than I do. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I'm, when a, God, I'm a little older than him. So I guess I, so when God's, so when God says, Gary, that he numbers the hairs on your head, that's not a tough job for him. No, not anymore. No, not at all. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I tell you what, man. I every time I get around a bunch of bearded guys, I I feel you know like a one of those hairless Chinese uh, Chihuahua dogs. Cause every time I try to grow out a beard, man, I just look freaking homeless. I just look homeless. It's it's solid white. I don't have any salt and pepper. Uh, my my beard was red uh, when I was a wee lad, and uh, man, it turned white. I think around forty, which happened to coincide when my daughter destroyed acorn. So I think that also expedited uh the the bleaching of my hair follicles but hey rich i gotta tell you something about gary man and it's in it's uh it's something that i find interesting that um i never hear anybody talk about it anymore i don't even know if it's a thing but gary uh was a world-class shot putter i don't hear anybody Whoa. talking about you know tossing a shot put now um but uh gary's it's still a thing is it still a sport are people still doing it Oh, yeah, yeah. It's In fact, I just uh, started uh, coaching at a local high school here. Oh, that's they, had, they had a regional a regional meet, and I've known the coach for years, and he asked me to come over and help out. And so I, I – but uh, three of th- – well, the, th- the three people I coached, uh, all three of them were going to the state meet in May. Great. So, um, uh, no, it's – I still do it. In fact, I still do the Masters. I, when I turned 70 last year, it put me into the category – into a different category where the shot is now uh, at junior high school weight for a 70 year old as four, okay. four, ki- four kilos, about 8.8 pounds. Yeah. And uh, so, no, I still do it. That still sounds heavy. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's funny because I picked up the six, I have, I have a, the high school boys, which they throw a 12, 12 pound shot and I have them warm up with a 16 pound. And I, I picked that thing up and it's heavy. And yet I used to throw, you know, I used to throw the 12 and the 16. So anyway, it's... I, wow, how, how far could you throw that thing, the 16? Well, when I was in high school, I threw the the, the 12 pounds, 64 feet. Whoa. And I threw... I was a Pennsylvania state record holder my senior year, and I was ranked uh, fifth in the nation. And um, I, I threw the 16 around 55. I was on a track and field scholarship, but I really gravitated towards the javelin because uh, size-wise, I was really not that big for a shot putter, at least when you go to 16 pounds. Wow. That's incredible. Like 16 pounds. That's the heavy, heavy, heavy bowling ball weight. Yeah. Yeah. And that guys throw that, you know, 70, 
70 some feet. Gosh. But they're That's monsters. Incredible. I mean, they're 6'4, 270, 280 pounds, bench press, you know, 550. I mean, they're, they are really just massive, massive men. How refreshing is it to talk about frickin' throwing a shot put and a javelin, you know? <laughs> I no, mean, I'm this, not interested in I could, throwing I a could, shot put. I'm going to be I honest. Could. It's like pick up this heavy thing and throw it right there. But it, throwing a javelin, that sounds like fun right there. I, I could get down with throwing a javelin. A lot of states don't have it anymore. Pennsylvania, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania had it, Louisiana. In fact, Terry Bradshaw was a national uh, uh, javelin uh, champion. So you well, wonder why sense, he could right? throw the football as far as he did. He threw the javelin to like 250-some feet. So, Wow. Wow. Well, that's impressive. Like, obviously different mechanics, but I mean the same, you're using the same muscles in the body, the hips, and that's impressive. When I was, uh, when I was in seventh grade, I think I weighed like, you know, 28 pounds or something. And um, we were having a <laughs> softball throwing contest. And I was, you know, baseball was my sport. I don't know why they had us lobbing a softball. But anyway, I tossed that thing uh, 88 yards, and I'll never forget my black PE coach comes up to me. He goes, he goes, brother, where does that come from? It's like rage, rage. That's where it all hey, hails Doug, from. My eighth grade year, junior high, I, I wrestled 84 pounds, and I weighed about 81 pounds, just naturally. Right. That's light, brother. That's a tiny dude. That was, that and was, now that I'm was almost many, that many same years weight. ago. <laughs> yeah like one side of your stomach yeah like two and a half times that come on somebody hey gary does anybody <laughs> does anybody in uh the high school shot put uh, uh crew that you're overseeing is there any girls that are identifying as a guy wanting to to lob that 16 pounder <laughs> I, I i tried to do it for the meat uh uh but they would they they just said it's obvious you have a beard so you know we just really can't do it no it's it's a christian school uh, the kids are pr pretty good, um, and I haven't really, <laughs> although I have to say yesterday, which was the region meet, there was one particular girl thrower that I really couldn't tell one way or the other, but she was a girl, but it was hard, it was hard to tell. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway, what are you going to do? Yeah. So, um, so Gary's forte, Rich, in Wars and Wild Men. Uh, viewer, listener, is, like I said, God and government and uh, the end of the world and uh, his book, Last Day's Madness. When did you pen that, Gary? Because I, I, I think I was first turned on to it back in 1990. I was trying to remember this morning. Uh, 1988. Okay. Uh, 1988 was uh, Last Day's Madness and the Reduction of Christianity. Those were, the, those were the two biggies in 1988. And that's when Gary North and I debated uh, uh, Tommy Ice and Dave Hunt on the on the topics of well, actually on eschatology and Christian involvement in the in the realm of politics, right? Which a lot of the dispensationalists and the retreatists think that you know this is it, it's the end of the world. You know what does Michael Stipe and Hal Lindsey have in common? Well, they both thought it was the end of the world as they knew well, it back in nineteen. Something that I think is important is that we tell the warriors and wild men listener that may not know what eschatology is and. What you're talking about when you say things like dispensationalists and retreatists, I think that would be important too. Yeah, take us to church, Gary. Well, eschatology is a fancy word that simply means it's a uh, what a person thinks and acts on in terms of the future. Uh, like Francis Nigel Lee wrote a book uh, years ago, a fat book about a thousand page called Communist Eschatology. The communists believe that with full force for communism, that communism would in fact take over the world. And that was their, es their that was their eschatology. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea of the Nazi, you know, third Reich that would list, last for a thousand years was, was Hitler's view of taking his Nazi worldview and uh, working that out in eschatologically, how this would work out in the future. And it, it's, it's mostly used in terms of, of Christians who have an es eschatology about, that is their belief about what's going to happen in the future. And the most popular version of that is the dispensational version. I won't get into all the details of it, but essentially means that we're living in the last days. All the signs that you see taking place today are indicators that Jesus is coming soon, that he's going to rapture his church. He's going to take the church off the earth 
the Antichrist is going to rise, you know, rebuilt temple, there's going to be a war with Israel, Russia's going to invade, China's going to have a 200 million man army to come in against Israel. And, and in fact, it's, and this is why you, you know, tie in eschatology to, to government, because a lot of Christians will not get involved in government because they believe we're living in the last days. And there's nothing that you can do to change anything because it's inevitable well, that's that the Christ is going to rise and take over everything. But that's a fatalist mentality, right? Like that's a like. Well, yeah, you and I look at that and say it's a fatalist me- mentality, but they're looking at it as it's victory. They're going to be taken off the earth and the, the you know, the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket, but they're going to be they're going to be free of all that because Jesus took them to heaven in something called a rapture. So they see that as victory. Uh, but as you know, Doug you know knows this. But people have been predicting the end of the world, you know, for thousands of years, and they're using the same Bible verses that are being used today. But in 1970, Hal Lindsey came out with a book called "The Late Great Planet Earth," and think about that—that that was 51 years ago. And he said in that book that Jesus was going to return sometime before 1988. Uh, Israel became a nation again in 1948, and he said a generation would not pass away until all these things take place. You add 40 to 1948, you get 1988. And, of course, here we are, uh, you know, know, 2021, and Christians are still bogged down in this idea that you can't change anything because Jesus is coming soon. And so eschatology matters, and it, also, it yeah. matters specifically for, for the Christian. Yes. Yeah, so Gary, is it is it more of a an American funk uh, in regards to this defeatist mentality that Jesus is going to rapture us when once we get our flesh pinched a little bit? I mean, does does that also inundate like the church in China, uh, uh, the Christians in the Middle East? Are they looking for a rapture because they're they're undergoing more persecution and more you know, serious, serious problems uh, than the American church is. We're curled up in the fetal position, closing our churches down because a bad cold from China, you know, hit our nation. And we think that, you know, because it's kind of like we're the tip of the spear. It's like whatever happens to America, that means the end is come and Jesus is, uh, <laughs> he's wrapping up, you know, the credits on this failed earth flick. And um, I don't know, do the, do, you've been to China. Uh, do they have that kind of, mindset that they want to get raptured out or are they digging in and, and praying and precatory prayers down on their CCP leaders? Uh, I think it depends on the, on the group, but I get emails from people all over the world and, you know, telling me that they go to a church that, you know, essentially believes this popular idea that we're living in the last days and Jesus is coming back soon. And we were in, in, in China, the, the group that we were with, that we were visiting these churches, did have a, an end time eschatology similar to dispensationalism, uh, but it, it really is all over the world. Uh, I got, I've, I've been down to Guatemala and uh, friends in, in, in Chile and in other parts of Central and South America, and it's very, very prevalent in, in Central and South America uh, as, as much as it is here. But th- right. this, this is all beginning to change. It, it really is beginning to change. There's a younger generation coming up are willing to take a look at this again. Uh, I, I've never seen so much interest on, in this topic um, in, in my 40 some years of, of, of doing this. And I, when I used to do radio interviews, I would get blasted on the radio uh, and people would call in and call me a heretic. They would call the office, my wife would answer the phone and they would say, your husband, you know, they wouldn't know it. They didn't know it was my wife and they would say, Gary DeMar is the Antichrist and so forth. And then recent, you know, years, a couple of years ago, I'd get on the radio and almost everybody agreed with me. It wasn't fun anymore. Right. Uh, and so there's been a, a tremendous shift taking place. And I, I think it's I think it's going to I think it's impacting the world because the, the view that I'm espousing, which isn't anything new. Right. It's been around for a long time. People are beginning to grab onto it and seeing it as a more consistent way of reading Bible Hey, speaking of something new, Gary, um, why don't you educate our viewers, listeners, to where the rapture fever started back well, let, in the mid 1800s? Let me jump in real quick because I gotta, I gotta make a quick uh, point here, Gary. Um, you said that they would call in and call you the Antichrist, right? Well, I think that's funny because I remember I was under some attack from some people, and one of the things they were calling me was the Antichrist. And a really good friend of mine came up to me and said. 
hey, uh, I heard they're calling you the Antichrist. I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, no offense, but uh, if you're the Antichrist, I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's funny that the word Antichrist comes up a lot. I, I was, tell people that there's more talk about the Antichrist than Jesus Christ these days. That's true. Yeah, true. Uh, and, and, and yet I, I'll ask somebody, I said, can you give me a biblical definition of Antichrist? First John 4, man. Yeah, that's 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 what yeah. they use. They go, go to the Bible, and I said, tell me what the biblical definition of Antichrist is. And it's funny. They say, well, it's somebody who opposes Christ. And I said, well, that's really not the biblical definition of Antichrist. The biblical definition of Antichrist is someone who says that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh. That is the biblical definition of Antichrist. And they, a lot of people are surprised by that. And I said... <laughs> Then the next question I asked, I said, how many Antichrists are there? And they're kind of stumbled by that because John says that there are many Antichrists. And the next right. question I asked is, I said, when is the Antichrist? And if you look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John makes it very clear that the Antichrists he was talking about were alive and well in his day. And that that was an indicator that the the, the, the prophecy that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 24 was about to take place, which in fact did take place with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So who were the New Testament antichrists? They were Jews who refused to believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Yeah. That's what a biblical antichrist is. Yeah, but you can't make a movie out of that, Gary. Yeah, you I was need- going to say, I got my definition <laughs> of antichrist from the omen, all the different parts, so... So you're not going to talk me out of that with Bible verses, Gary. Good try, though. No, I thought it was uh, I thought it was Gorbachev. You know, with that birthmark on the <laughs> forehead and stuff. Hey, Gary. So, so you're so you're telling me Ronald Ronald Wilson Reagan. There you go. Six. So you're telling me that that <laughs> we all could be wrong that Madonna is not the whore of Babylon. No, she's, no, she's not. No, okay. No, no. Well, I guess I was misled. So back to the rapture uh, uh, stuff that rose, was it 1835, something like that, that started infecting the church and, and how it took off through study Bibles during the revivalist movement in the early 20th century? Yeah, this, the, really, this, well, Darby you know, made it pretty popular. They had all these prophecy conferences all over the world. And, of course, with the rise of you know, World War I comes, obviously that was the end. And that didn't happen. Then World War II comes and, well, you know, Hitler is obviously the Antichrist. In fact, I have a book. I have a book in my library that was published, I think, in 1926 by Oswald Smith. And he claimed that Mussolini was the Antichrist. Uh, and you know, I, I have a collection of all the, of all of these books and magazines and articles about who, who was the Antichrist. You, know, you pin the tail on the Antichrist. But it was a Schofield reference Bible by C.I. Schofield that really popularized the modern day dispensational end time pre-tribulational rapture of the church. And that's what people generally believe. But most of them could not defend their own position. And I question them all the time. I said, give me one verse in the Bible. I said, I'm not looking for a lot of them. Just give me one verse in the Bible that says that Jesus, Jesus is going to return and take the church off the earth before, during, or after a seven-year period. And they'll point to a couple passages, and I'll say, now I'll read it, and tell me if those, those, those ideas are in those passages. And a lot of them are shocked. They, they read them, and it's not there. But they will still believe it. Many of them will still believe it because that's what they were taught. And they feel like if the prop is taken out from that particular doctrine, how many other props are going to be taken out as well? Gary, could, I'd like to ask you a question. I'm going to make this personal about me for a second. So um, in, in my church, we have a training that we're doing, and it's on the essential, the essential doctrines of Christianity. And one of those is the return of Christ. And so in a nutshell, what, is, what would be the essential doctrines for Christians for the return of Christ? Like if, if, like, if you didn't believe this, you're not a Christian. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's typical. That's typical. But you have to keep something in mind. The rapture and the second coming of Jesus are not the same thing. Correct. 
Okay, let me, again, I know your audience, I don't know where they are, and they may look at science. All different levels, all science different science levels. Sounds crazy and all that, it, much of it is. But the rapture is that, that Jesus returns invisibly and takes the church off the earth, and then there's a thousand years where Jesus, then Jesus will return, and he will reign on the earth for a thousand years. That's, that's the general view. And then at the end of a thousand years, that's when... That's when the what has been typically described as the consummating coming of Christ. That that's the end of all things, and then the new heavens and the new earth take place. So the second coming of Christ, according to this system, can't happen for another thousand years. But the rapture is a new thing. It, it teaches that, that the church is going to be taken off the earth prior to this 1,000-year period. And there are actually five rapture positions, but we don't need to get into all of them. The most popular one is, is that before all hell breaks loose and before the Antichrist is re revealed, the church is going to be taken off the earth. And then people say, why polish brass on a sinking ship? All the signs are an indication that Jesus is going to return in our generation. And what we're seeing around us today is a fulfillment of all that. So why bother? But we've been why bothering for you know sixty or seventy years, and I think <laughs> we're, we're beginning to see the implications of that kind of failed eschatology. Okay, so you skillfully avoided my question. I appreciate that. But um, <laughs> I, <laughs> here we go. I, yeah, but here's, and I wasn't asking with a with a an end in mind. I literally haven't taught. I, I'm doing this ten part series, and I've skipped this one every single time. Because there's so many different viewpoints, there's things that you could teach, there's things that I could teach, but I don't know how to say, if you believe this, you're a Christian, and if you don't believe this, you're a not, you're not, and so how do I teach what's essential and non-essential as it pertains to the end times? But yeah, anyway, I, would, I, have a, I, would. I have a verse that settles it for me, which doesn't mean I'm not interested, because I want to read your book and I want to know more about it, but I would have to say that when it comes to biblical knowledge, my least understanding is in end times, in eschatology. So I kind of live by this verse. It's not an excuse or a cop-out. I, I need to learn. Um, in Luke 19, 13, Jesus said, occupy till I come. And so I'm of the mindset that, that Jesus's last command should be our first priority, that the purpose of the church is not worship, but the purpose of the church is the Great Commission so that people would be converted, so that the most people that could go to heaven would go to heaven. And so my mentality is until whatever happens is going to happen, we need to get people saved. So, yeah, yeah. So tell me what you think about yeah, that. I, I want to hear. Yeah, that's a good. That's that's a. A lot of people call that pan millennialism. It's all going to pan yeah. out in the end, and this is what you do in between. <laughs> but you mentioned kind of like what do you have to believe to be considered an Orthodox Christian, and you don't have to believe in the rapture. You do have to believe that Jesus is going to return again sometime in the future, and we don't know when. Right. Yeah, that, that's that's the Nicene Creed. You know, Jesus. But Gary, that, that what not not to interrupt you, but what you just said, as I keep studying and reading about this to teach on it, like I said, it's my least knowledgeable area. I have such a hard time finding anything that I could say this is essential beyond what you just said, literally. And I'm like, well, that's a five minute teaching. Yeah, uh, but uh, I here's here's the thing. What happens? Somebody will come and say, well, what about what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, wars and rumors of wars, the gospel has to, has to be preached in the whole world, da 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 And, and, and is, you know, aren't there wars and rumors of wars and famines in various places and earthquakes and so forth? And here's my answer to that. And this is why I wrote Last Days of Madness. In Matthew chapter 24, which is called the Olivet Discourse, and everybody always will go to that. And they'll say, well, how do you answer all of this? I have a good, I have a good friend. I don't know if you, you, you know um, who Kirk Cameron is. Uh, yeah, I know who he is. Okay, Kirk Cameron was in a show called, I think, Growing Pains. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and, and he, was, he, actually, he actually starred in the first two uh, Left Behind movies. Right. I hate those movies. Sorry, go ahead. Lord forgive him. He was involved, he was involved <laughs> in, in that. And we have a mutual friend who said, hey, Kirk, you need to watch this video series that Gary DeMar did. And if they're each, each session is about 20 minutes, and I have an outline that goes along with it. And Kirk would put, put the DVD in and watch it and say, you know, this was all on Matthew chapter 24. Well, okay, he convinced me of that. 
and then he put another DVD in, and he said, well, he convinced me of that. He got down to this idea that the gospel had, been, had to be preached in the whole world before the end came, and a lot of people said, well, that hasn't happened yet. Well, I said, according to the Bible, that has happened, if you look at Colossians 1, 6 and Colossians 1, 23 and other places. But then he got all— What, what does it say? Tell me, t- just give me a brief shot what that says, yeah. In Colossians, you were saying? Colossians, you, the, the, if you go look at Matthew chapter 24, 14, it says the gospel has to be preached in the whole world to all the nations, and then the end will come. Right. And people will say that hasn't happened yet. Right. And yet, and yet in Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, Jesus says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, which would then include Matthew 24, 14. And people will say, are you telling me that the gospel was preached in the whole world before that generation passed away? And the question I ask is, what would be the only thing to convince you that that passage has been, in fact, fulfilled? If the Bible said that the gospel had been preached in the whole world before that generation passed away. And sure enough, that's, the Bible does say that in Colossians 1.3. Colossians 1.26 says that the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven. Now, that's obviously hyperbole, but what's interesting about Matthew 24, 14, when it, that word world there isn't the typical word for world. The typical word for world is cosmos. For God so loved the cosmos, God so loved the world. The word that's used there is oikumene. Uh, oikos means house, uh, and it's the only time Matthew uses it. And it's the same word that's used in, Matt, in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, where it says that a, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world be taxed. It's oikumene. Now, you and I know, and Doug, we all would agree, that Rome would have loved to have taxed the whole wide world, but could only, could only tax the Roman Empire. Mm. That's why that word oikumene was used, because it deals with limited geography. So Jesus in Matthew 24, 14, he doesn't use the word cosmos, he uses oikumene, the same word that's used in Luke 2, 1. Mm. But so when you put in, in So does Paul does Paul utilize that same word in Colossians 1, 3 and uh, Romans 10? Well, it's 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 interesting that Paul actually uses the word cosmos in in, in Romans chapter 1 and mm. Romans 10 to say that the gospel had in fact been preached. Uh, so no matter which way you cut this, can, how about this in Mark 16? What what word is used? Go into all the world, and preach the gospel. Probably cosmos. I'm going to guess it's cosmos. Yeah. But see, then in wow. Romans, chap, Romans chapter one, Paul says that the gospel had been preached to the whole world. Coloss- Romans chapter 16, Paul says the gospel had been preached to all the nations. And in First Timothy chapter three, verse 16 that the gospel had, in fact, been preached to all the world. And so if you let the Bible interpret itself, what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 has been fulfilled. Now, this is important because once you get through, so let me finish my thing with Kirk Cameron. So Kirk Kirk gets to the the passage about the sun, moon, and stars. And he says, he said, there is no way that Gary DeMar is going to convince me when Jesus talks about the sun going dark and the moon going dark and the stars falling from heaven, that that was be fulfilled prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, before that generation passed away. Well, you put the DVD in and listen to what I had to say, and he was convinced. That language that Jesus is used, that Jesus uses, is borrowed from the Old Testament, which talks about judgment on nations, sun, moon, and stars. It's interesting that flags, you look at almost all the flags around the world, what do you find on flags? Sun, moon, and stars. And sun. Moon, Islamic nations, and the United States stars. Why? Because nations under the Old Testament, under kind of Oriental language, depicted nations. And, and, and Jesus uses that, well, the old, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 13, on the judgment of Egypt, it talks about the, you know, the, the, the sun the sun going dark and the moon going dark. Jesus borrows that language and applies it to the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in AD 70. So I, I just put all this together to give it a comprehensive reading. But your point, though, orthodoxy, what does what does what do the creeds say about 
um, what's essential. And the one thing that's essential is, according to the creeds, that Jesus will come again sometime in the future to judge the quick and the dead. Boom. I, like I, deal, with their, I deal with everything in between, though, to try to, dis- well, try to get people out of their comfort zone. But my que- and I appreciate that because my question really was, and you answered it. That's that's it in a nutshell. Having answered that, I really am interested in reading your book and learning more about what you're talking about. But I really was having a hard time with because there were so many viewpoints. It's not like we could go, hey, three percent of Christians have correct doctrine. The rest of the world's going crazy, right? Then we're a sect or some kind of crazy cult. So I like what you said. That's a great answer. But it does make me interested in, in reading your book and trying to understand the rest of what you're talking about. I, 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 I think I mean, I've, it's gone through a number of editions and numerous, numerous printings. Uh, it's pretty comprehensive. It's, it's not difficult to understand. Uh, covers a lot of ground. Uh, and it will, it, I, I firmly believe, <clears throat> other people have told me, it will change your complete, your, the, the way you read the Bible. Yep. And, and I want to make this point. There's really nothing in this, in Last Day's Madness, that's new. It's all been written about before. It's just been, it's like an onion. There have been layers and layers and layers of other junk over it that have obscured, uh, obscured the obvious texts and what, they, and what they mean. Timing is important when you look at Bible prophecy. When does a prophecy say is going to be fulfilled? Jesus mm. said, this generation will not pass away and all these things take place. Sometimes it talks about near, shortly, quickly, at hand. Keep all that stuff in mind, and you won't go too much as, too, too astray on dealing with Bible prophecy. Yeah, it's like in Revelation 1, where uh, John said these things must shortly take place, or quickly take place. If I said, Rich, I'm going to give you a Corvette, and um, do you think, you know, okay, maybe a month. I'll give him two months to, to bring the Corvette to my house in, in Cave Creek. Nobody thinks two thousand years later, twenty five hundred years later. It's yeah, you know. I mean, it's it's immediately. You know, John said this stuff is going down right now. But you know, when it gets to the dating of the Book of Revelation, that's where the dispensationalists played fast and loose with with the dates, ignoring again the internal evidence. You know, from the Book of Revelation that the temple is still standing. Uh, they're like, well, he, you know, he wrote it, you know, in AD ninety six where Gentry proves uh, that, you know, he wrote it in the early 60s before Jerusalem fell. I think, you know, uh, not only is Gary's book, Last Day's Madness, just a must read, but Gary, one of your buddies, uh, I think he did the yeoman's work of probably one of the most easy to read commentaries, verse by verse on the book of Revelation, David Chilton, Days of Vengeance, and Paradise Restored. I think, you know, those those are in the top 10 books that I've ever read. I mean, just amazing, you know, what he lined out in those two tomes. Yeah, Paradise Restored. David Chilton was a, was a terrific writer. Gary North, who was, who was an editor writing in his own writing. Gary's probably written, I don't know, 80 or 90 books. He said David Chilton is the only writer that he never had to change a word of anything he ever wrote. Whoa. Paradise Restored is a great introduction to this whole topic. And it's, it's mostly broad themes, uh, but people's lives have been transformed by it because it's very optimistic in its es- eschatological perspective. And then he wrote, a, he wrote a, a commentary on the book of Revelation called Days of Vengeance. David died in, I think, 1997 of a heart attack. Um, and uh, actually... After being brought back from the dead, he had he had he was pronounced dead a few years before a heart attack, and they just they worked and worked and worked on him and brought him back to life. And a couple of years later, his heart was so damaged. A couple of years later, he had another heart attack and died. But uh, those two books are fundamental if you want to understand uh, Bible prophecy. We'll make sure to put links so that people can look those up. You know, it's interesting. Doug and I were having a conversation one night, smoking a cigar, talking, and Doug started introducing some of these topics to me. You remember that, Doug? Yep. We are in Yuma, and Doug talked for, I don't know, 30 or 45 minutes, and I was listening to him, and he goes, and, and he finished talking, and he says, so what do you think? And I was just sitting there looking at him. You remember, I know you remember this, Doug. He, I, I was just sitting there looking at him, and I had an answered. and he goes, hey, what do you think? I said, well, it's a lot. Give me a minute. <laughs> and I said, 
I don't know enough about it to make a decision in one minute. I told him it's going to take a little bit more time than that. And I, I think it's that kind of a topic. And, and one thing that I think is great, Gary, is that, um, I was thinking your book's probably not going to change my mind because my mind's not made up on a lot of that stuff. I, I'm interested in reading it because I'd like to have some perspective that makes sense because a lot of the stuff that I read, even the dispensationalism that you're talking about, a lot of the stuff doesn't make sense. Now, I don't have a problem with dispensationalists looking to try to explain some simple things, but when you start building all of your doctrine, your theology and your eschatology on that, I think it gets silly. It's not consistent. And so I'm really interested in learning. I was interested in listening to Doug that night I just didn't have enough pieces to get a hold of it. You remember that, Doug? And I was like, I, wh what do you want me to say? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, a, mature, that's a mature uh, uh, perspective. I mean, I wish more people had it rather than, than uh, uh, automatically going off and, and you know, trying to debate and refute it if they've never really looked at the other side of this. And, and like I mentioned, I always tell people, I, anything I'm giving you is not new. It's mm. been around for a very, very long time. That doesn't right. make it right. Just like something new doesn't make it make it wrong. Uh, but I, I'm not coming along and just and, and talking about something that's been completely made up on the spot a couple of years ago. Right. I'll tell you, one of, one of, one of the things that won me over uh, to, you know, this eschatology of victory, <clears throat> which is I like to call it. I was I was in Lubbock, Texas in 1990. And uh, Rick Godwin had just gotten a hold of your book, Last Day's Madness. H have you ever met Rick? Yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, man, I had never heard anybody preach a message about hope, dominion, to hell with the devil, uh, quit crying, quit curling up in the fetal position. We don't have to look forward to Jesus' second coming to make all things better. His first coming was pretty darn good, you know? Yeah. Hello. And that's that's a thing because I was in a I was in a charismatic, uh, non-denominational, you know, formally Assembly of God church, and it was just rapture, 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 rapture. Uh, go to Christian concerts, cover dish dinners, you know. Don't 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 get a graduate degree. Don't plan on you know a multi generational uh, vision for America or for your family or for your business. It's all over. The fat lady sung. And Godwin's like, she's not even fat yet. She's not even a lady. <laughs> she's she hasn't even started taking voice lessons. Okay, and it completely changed my mind. And he preached on uh, Genesis one, the Dominion mandate, and then Matthew twenty eight. Mm -hmm. You know, the Great Commission. And it's not just you know win souls, which is very important, but it's command nations. You know, to come into alignment uh, with the will of God. And so it's mm. it's expansive. It's not just, you know, get people converted, get them tithing, you know, get them operational. You know, that word, like the scripture you quoted back in Luke 19 about occupy till I come, that's militaristic language. You know, we're not talking about, you know, some kind of Christian yeah. military, but it's it's the church triumphant. It's the gates of hell will right. not prevail against the church. And it has nothing to do, it has crap all to do with what happens you know, once he returns, when he returns, it's over, you know, <laughs> there ain't going to be a, yeah, that's you a know, wrap. yeah, it's, it's just completely over, you know? So Gary, yeah, yeah Rick, I like, I like what you're saying, Doug, about the victorious mindset. Cause I think that's, that's the result of uh, good doctrine. Good theology is a victorious mindset. Anytime it's this victim, hopeless, fatalist well you look at you look stoic. at the none of that stuff works you know gary one of the the cool things that that uh chilton brought up in paradise restored was just you know the song aspect of what used to be the church's hymnal you know the psalms and the psalms are not you know poor us tiny little jesus big antichrist you know uh small jehovah huge goliath none of that is in the psalms and the church used to sing this triumphant music and ergo, you know, we kick butt and take names for, you know, for many, many moons. Now we've got these sad little weepy, you know, rescue me, swing low, sweet chariot, you know, I'll fly away. And, and so ipso facto, man, you got a big defeated, haggard bride that is not glorious and is not global and is not stomping, you know, demonic skulls. So I think, you know, eschatology to me is hugely important. Like when, when I, you know, 
got that revelation of like, no, you're not going to go wimping off, you know, the stage after being, you know, bested by the, by the antichrist and the beast, mm. you know, they're on the run yeah. from us. And here's another thing, Gary, that I think is interesting is that, is that, you know, Jesus is uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. There's two thirds mm -hmm. of his ministering angels who are complete badasses. Anybody who saw an angel at any time, at any place, they felt like dead men. Satan's a created being who's been stomped uh, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He's, he's losing power every day, and he's got only one third of his defeated host at his behest. How in the world do we lose? Well, here's you know you, you bring up the you bring up the devil you know the, in Reve in uh, Genesis chapter three there's this little picture of the the woman and the the, the uh, her heel the serpent and so forth where the, her heel crushes the head of the serpent and you go through scripture you remember Jael you know she takes a tent peg and puts it through Sisera's mm -hmm. head and then you have an unnamed woman who drops a uh, an upper millstone on a uh, <laughs> yeah. head. And, but when you get into the New Testament, it's interesting. The place where Jesus is crucified is called Golgotha or Golgotha, place of a skull. And so the, the stake of the cross essentially crushes the head of the serpent right there on on, on, on Golgotha. In fact, you know, go back, D David, what does David do to Goliath? Hits him in the head and cuts his head off. And But the, the, the capstone to all this is in, Re in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, where it says, God will soon crush Satan under your feet. So the this, church. this motif, yes, this motif of head crushing, this is, this is why Chilton's book is so good, because he puts the, he puts these these uh, motifs all the way through all, all the way through his book how the bible the reason it's called a bible it is one book even though there are 66 individual books it all fits together but the message is victorious all the way through there isn't this idea of woe is me satan is in control of this world although there's the passage in second corinthians 4 about satan is the god of this world actually it says satan is the god of this age and in order and he's talking about the age leading up to the destruction of jerusalem this is this transforms people. We, you know, we started off talking about athletics. You imagine if, if a kid, you kept telling the kid, man, go out there and do all you, all you, you can, even though you're going to lose. Just go out there and <laughs> right. get on that football field as soon as Come you Come join the losing line. team. Yeah, yeah. Well, Gary, that's what they're telling kids now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's, here's your participation trophy. Uh, I mean, that's, and, and kind of that's what's happened to Christianity. Mm. We're, we're satisfied with a participation trophy Come on, man, man. rather than victory in the person and work of Jesus Christ and the, and the application of his word to every area of life that was in, in ages past transformative, mm -hmm, which, right. which gave us the world that we're, that we're losing today. See, I, I love that because Finney says that people have more faith in the transforming, and I think it applies to this, more faith in the transforming power of the grave than in the transforming power of the cross. Like people are still waiting for something ha to happen so they can be who God's called them to be. When that event has already happened, the central theme of all of eternity was Jesus crucified and raised from the dead. The power has been released and people are still looking forward to some magical event or right. some transition that's going to make them better or something. Hey, I think that's a, I think it's a great move. Uh, you got to give a hat tip to El Diablo to get all the Christians uh, again to, you know, to postpone what's supposed to occur here on the victory. planet earth. Yeah. yeah. Hey Gary, we got, uh, we got to run, man. Um, give us 30, 40 seconds of where folks can follow you and love to have you back on. Cause uh, there's a lot of stuff I'd like to talk yeah. about in regards to God and government. And what, you know, the church has completely lost their mind, you know, after COVID-19 and um, how they capitulated to mayors, prefects and governors instead of uh, the head of the church. But anyway, 30, 40 seconds. Where do the Warriors and Wild Men folks need to go and um, just hit us, buddy. And final thought and final thought. To yeah, final thought there. and then where to go. Yeah, uh, you had mentioned that I was an American Vision president. I, am, I came back to American Vision as president in 2019 to rebuild it because the person who had it before kind of, you know, messed it up. 
but you can get anything I've written and books and articles at AmericanVision.org. I have a, a, a daily daily podcast in addition to a daily article. So anything at AmericanVision.org, Last Days Madness, Wars and Rumors of Wars, uh, God and Government is the kind of application of what the Bible says about government, noting that government isn't synonymous with politics. God is a governor of all things, self-government under God, family governments, church governments, and a decentralized civil government. Uh, I, I'm optimistic. I, I, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of things happening, a lot of younger guys coming up embracing a lot of this stuff and they're getting involved in media and film uh, schools education curriculum and so forth so i i'm i'm optimistic that we're, we're going to turn things around it may be may be tough maybe in the trenches for a while yeah. but ultimately um it's it's second peter chapter three um they will not make further progress as they become more and more consistent with their unbelieving thought amen gary we appreciate you big dog and i um, glad to call you friend, and uh, I can't recommend highly enough uh, following him at AmericanVision.org. Rich, anything, brother? Yeah, thanks a lot, Gary. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Looking forward to meeting you in person, and I'm going to check out the books and, and look forward to having you on again so we could follow up on that. Great stuff, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. All right. God bless. All right, Rich, what is the Warriors and Wild Men enthusiast, the one – who is dipping into this uh, podcast right now, what do they need to do? Well, they can go on this uh, podcast feed where they're seeing it and they'll see links to the books that Gary has written and a couple other books that Doug made reference to. You'll be able to see the links to get those books because we want to get you educated. Come on, somebody. And then go to warriorsandwildmen.com, subscribe, like us, love us. Um, subscribe, it's free, and we'll shoot you a couple emails a week, let you know what's happening. Follow us on social media while you can still find us, but make sure to subscribe so that we can stay in contact with you when they start canceling us or continue to cancel us on social media. If you want to help support us, hit the war chest. For those that are doing that, we appreciate you guys. It's tax deductible. We'll send you the information of that. Warriors and Wild Men, out. Warriors and Wild Men.